Hi, I'm Whitney. And I'm Brandon. And we love to tell true crime stories. We've got a lot of opinions and absolutely no qualifications. Welcome to Criminally Unqualified. Today, in honor of Women's History Month, I am going to be telling you a story about three incredibly badass women. They were part of the Dutch resistance. They fought the Nazis. Um, This is the Overstegen sisters, Trues and Freddie, and their friend Hanny Shaft. So they did incredible things. I don't know if there's a movie on it. I've told you a little bit about this before, but like super high level. Today, we're going to get into all the amazing stuff that they did. They were assassins. They made explosives. Um, They also helped transport Jewish children to safety. So these women are incredible. And I am so pumped to tell you this story today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So normally, this is where I ask you, what are you bringing to the podcast today? Yeah, but you're testing me, right? I am. So I gave you a little heads up that, okay, I think it was last week, you tested me on different terms to see if I would know them or not. I think I did pretty well. But it got me thinking. You, you know, are from California. You've lived in the Midwest now for a few years. And I want to see how Midwest are you. Am I a natural Midwesterner? So I don't know that you do all these things, but I've got five questions for you. I made this quiz. So the answers are deemed to be correct by me and only me because it's my fucking test. Born and raised. Okay. In the Midwest. So you get. You ready? Yep. Okay. So number one. You're at the grocery store and you accidentally bump into somebody nearby or you almost bump into them. What do you say? Okay, bud. No, I'm joking. What do you say? Uh, what do you say when you bump into somebody? Or you almost bump into them. You're in the Midwest at the grocery store. What are you going to say? Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, right. hold on. Let me think about this. Your time is up. All uh, right. The answer is, oh, or, oh, sorry about that. Or we'd also accept, oh, sorry about it. Didn't see you there. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> what? That's like the universal when you almost bump into somebody. Oop, so I was like, sorry. Oop, 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 oop. I feel like that's Canadian. Nope. Oop. Nope. <laughs> nope. All right. Well, you've got your first one wrong. It's disappointing. But I honestly have never heard you say, oh, so I wasn't surprised on that. No, I was like, my bad. All right. Second question. I think you can get this. It's fall. You're ready to go to a bonfire. So you get dressed and you put on your best blank. Flannel. Yes, that's the correct answer. Uh, Other acceptable answers would have been North Face jacket or vest, camo pants, or college football sweatshirt. Amazing job. Thank you. Great job. All right, third question. We're leaving a restaurant. What is the last thing you do before we walk out the door? Uh, Fucking... It's complimentary on the way out. What are you going to take? What are you going to take? It's compliment. Uh, You're going to put it in your mouth. Toothpick. Yes. I was scared you were going to say waiter. A- Great job. Yes. Toothpick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fourth question. You have to make small talk with someone. What? Weather. Okay. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. I knew just fucking Midwest small talk weather. Fucking weather. Weather. Um, I also said bonus points if you say something about how you don't mind the cold, but the wind is the worst. (laughs) Okay. I do that all the time too, but just it's accurate. Okay. This is the last question. You have to briefly go outside to do something like go to the mailbox or take the garbage to the curb. Not very long. What is the lowest acceptable temperature to wear shorts to do this activity? 32 degrees. And the correct answer is you're not a little bitch. So you put on shorts in any temperature. If it's only going to be a few minutes, putting on warm weather <laughs> gear is too much work. That's right. Yeah. 32 is pretty good. I yeah. had to think about it for a minute. And I that, wear shorts all the time. So I know. that makes sense. Yep. That so. and that instance i'm a natural midwesterner yep you know so i agree yeah and that concludes our how midwestern are you all good uh questions except for the first one oop 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 it's not oop it's oop oop yeah oop yep it's fucking dumb well it's it just happens (laughs) never heard it one day you will have found yourself integrated into the midwest for so long that she will just find it will just caress your lips as it exits your mouth and then you'd be like holy fuck like poseidon's kiss ew uh Uh, i'm surprised you didn't have uh you're hiking on a trail and you pass somebody what's the universal thing that you do it's the the weird (laughs) awkward smile and the head nod (laughs) yeah it's like a not gonna murder you let's both keep walking please bye yeah (laughs) all right 
<clears throat> All right, so that concludes. Are you? Uh, how Midwestern are you? Yeah. Um, I feel like the only other thing I could have thrown in there is, what outdoor game do you play throwing bean bags at a board? Mm, yeah. Cornhole. 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 Sounds sexual. <laughs> it's the name of a sex move in the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> is it? <laughs> no. Oh. I don't know. Maybe, but that's not what I'm familiar with. <laughs> I hit her with the old cornhole. <laughs> gross all right well on a completely different subject i'm going to take us to our story completely unrelated yeah, tell me but about these badass women they are so badass i feel like it's one of those episodes we're just gonna be hyping them up and just like women we love women all right so the first time i ever heard about these women was years ago on a podcast i think it was on my favorite murder um, i'm almost positive georgia covered them but i didn't want to go back and listen because i didn't want to like be influenced by what you they know, said. Yep. By what they said. But now I want to go back and listen to it now that I've researched this. Um, so like I said, I've told you about them before, but super high level. So a little bit might kind of sound familiar to you, but this will all be pretty much new material. And then um, for people who don't know, Brandon actually never knows the story going in. I research and write the episode and he's just hearing it for the first time in real time. I know um, nothing. Yep. So it uh, just kind of makes it fun for us. It's really hard too, though, because as I'm researching, I'm used to like, I love to just yell fun facts at you. Always. And so then it's yeah. like the whole fucking week. I can't tell you what I'm researching about. Got to bottle that shit up. Oh my God. It's so hard. So then when I'm like ready to go by the time yeah. it's time to tell the story. Okay, so all of the material I researched for today's episode is cited in the show notes. A lot of my material came from a book uh, by Tim Brady called Three Ordinary Girls, The Remarkable Story of Three Dutch Teenagers Who Become Spies, Saboteurs, Nazi Assassins, and World War II Heroes. Not a succinct title, but man, they did so <laughs> much stuff, it's hard to... To mash it into one Yeah, thing. because you want to... Like, what I really wanted to title this episode was like, just fucking listen about these three badass women. You won't regret it. Even that's not short, though. No, but just, that's very long. Yeah. Longer. <laughs> it's longer, arguably. Yeah. Um, okay. But uh, it was a great read. Also, if you have Amazon Prime, um, it's free that you could read free on your Kindle. So I, I love that yeah. also. Yes. All right, so we're going to first start talking about the Overstegen sisters, and then we're going to talk about Hanny Shaft and kind of like they're in their own worlds, and they're going to kind of come together in this story. Right. So starting with Truce and Freddie, Truce was born in 1923, and Freddie was born in 1925, um, north of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, in an area called Harlem. And their parents were both socialists, and they were very politically active. They were known in political circles. Like, they didn't have a lot of money. It was a very much a working-class area. But her family very much believed um, in these causes and instilled that belief into their daughters at a very young age. Right. So mm. an article in his HistoryCollection.com described, in the 1930s, their parents actively assisted an organization known as Red Aid, which helped Jewish and political refugees escape Nazi Germany to the safety of the Netherlands and beyond. In their youth, the sisters grew accustomed to fugitives hiding out in their household um, from Dutch police who were likely to deport and hand them over to the Gestapo at the border. The pair were thus already anti-fascist long before the Germans conquered the Netherlands. So already at a young age. Yes. Yep, which is amazing. <clears throat> right. So um, their parents do eventually split. Their mother's name is Trienje, and um, she moves the girls out and into a flat, and she goes on to have a son as well named Robbie. So this is just a little bit about their background, but we're going to fast forward. It's August 31st, 1939, and Truce just turns 16 years old. And two days later, Germany invades Poland, and it's the start of World War II. So... I mean, I know we talk about like how millennials have been through so much like in our <laughs> lifetime, still not a world war, a lot of other terrible things, but yeah. I mean, in, just turning 18 and then having right, world war two hit. Right. And Germany is right, you know, right by Poland. It's also right by Germany's also right by the Netherlands. Like they're very, they're all kind of, you know, right around each other. Right. Now, just a little bit of history. The Netherlands really stayed out of world war one in terms of fighting because they have the stance of neutrality. And so it doesn't mean they weren't impacted by the war, but they weren't fighting in the war. Mm -hmm. And so as World War II is breaking out, the Netherlands is like, yeah, we're still neutral. Like this is going back to the 1800s. We're staying out of this. Right. However, I say this because Hitler had other plans and didn't care that they wanted to stay neutral. And it was also, you know, 
I don't think that the Netherlands were prepared. They just, the people were, I think, kind of shocked when they eventually get invaded because they, you know, it worked for them before. They just really didn't believe. They're like, hey, man, we're just out of this. Like, yeah. nobody's going to come for us. We're not fucking with them. Yep. We're chilling. Yes. So um, I think it's just kind of an important backdrop because a lot of the country is stunned when it happens. But like I said, Hitler has other plans for the Netherlands. Now we go forward one more year. It's September 1940, and the Nazis are now invading. Truce is 17, and her sister Freddie is 15 years old. And hell is just breaking loose around them. They see the planes come in. Um, when they realize that the Nazis are coming in, Trienje grabs her daughters and they start grabbing all of their political materials in the house because they know that at some point when the Germans come to their neighborhood, if they find their materials and find out that they're socialist or communist, at the very least, they're going to round them up and very possibly they might execute them. So they start burning their materials. Right. Um, it said truce actually saw the Germans roll in with their tanks um, into Harlem where they lived and she came back home and was quoted as saying the scum are here. Um, I fucking love these girls. All right. So that's what's happening with the Overstegen sisters, just kind of how they're starting with this. Now right. we're going to switch over to Joanna Joe Shaft. She later goes by the name Hanny. I'm just going to call her Hanny in this because it just helps that's keep it a little anyway. easier. Yep. Yep. Don't got to bounce between the two. Yes. I'm cool with that. So she's born in December 16th, 1920, also around the area of Harlem. So these girls don't know each other growing up. She's a little bit older than the other girls, but mm-hmm. close enough in age. And um, Hanny's family, they were a little um, more educated. They had um, kind of some higher up jobs versus kind of the working class family that Fred or sorry, that Fred, Freddie and Truce's family had, but her parents had the same political sentiments. Right. They also were very politically motivated. They talked about it around her all the time. So she felt the same way in her household growing up. Her family was also really overprotective of her. They had a daughter who died when she was seven, who was older. And so they really, while they encouraged her with her education, she was super smart. They wanted her to, you know, feel free to explore her ideas. They also kept her very close. Yeah. Um, Understandable too. Yes. Yeah. The last thing about Hanny is she had bright red hair, which was a really um, like notice noticeable feature about her. People actually made fun of her about it. Um, but she just had this beautiful red. One of the, the book I read was like, it wasn't strawberry blonde. Like she had bright red hair. So you could pick her out of a crowd. She was Wendy's red. <laughs> kind of, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, Hanny goes on to school to become a lawyer and she has two close friends who are Jewish there. And, uh, it's, I think she might even live with them for a while, but it's really hard for her to see how things are getting more and more dangerous and knowing that these people she loves so much are so impacted by them. So, um, she also joins some political groups on campus where they have a lot of debates and they talk a lot about like the Nazis and oppression and things like that. So again, we're still kind of in cir- different circles. All right. So we're going to circle back to what's going on in the area, and then we're going to start talking about these badass women and what they do. Okay. So when Germany invades the Netherlands, they immediately set up two police systems. So the Dutch police still exist, but the Germans have two police systems. They have the order police, who they also call the green police, and it's because they wear green uniforms. You can see them everywhere. And they're really responsible for oppressing the people. And so they um, suppress the population through like raids and arrests. If they did public executions, they held the crowds back. Um, just fucking Fuck, awful When you guys. tell me these things, I never fully grasp in what timeline we're in until you throw some shit out like public executions. It is insane. Like I was just thinking this was kind of like picture in modern day, even though I know it's not. It's yeah. World War II. I know it's... Back in, the, but I'm not picturing anything crazy. And then all of a sudden, public yeah. executions. It's insane. Wild. I mean, it just it escalates and escalates, and it it was really interesting to read that book. I definitely recommend it to anyone. Um, there's a lot of history in it, but it's been a while since I've like really read up on World War II and just to again hear what's happening. Is how horrible the time was. How horrible. Oh, yes. Um, Okay, so we have the order police or the green police. They're doing this day-to-day stuff. Then we have the security police, and they are looking for... um, Security, security. (laughs) What? 
Security, security. Is that from something? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, they are looking for mm. political criminals. So people who are against the Nazis. The propaganda. People who are, yeah, who are like actively trying to resist. And they're trying to infiltrate these groups, capture them, kill them. So there's So freedom of pieces. speech wasn't really a thing back then. Well, I... Freedom of just speech is defined differently, I guess, by different countries. But no, when the Nazis take over, there's no freedom mm. of anything. I'm going to go through some of the things that they start to take away. Yeah. But it's like they start, I won't say they start small, but they start taking some things away and then just more and more and more mm-hmm. until they were literally rounding Stripped up from everything and, and yeah. tr- taking people to concentration camps. Right. And it happens, I mean, relatively quickly because it's only over the course of a few years. Right. All right. So this is a direct quote from the book. Um, Oh, this is actually perfect timing. So in August, less than four months into the occupation, the Germans instituted their first anti-Jewish measures when they banned all Jewish religious services and rituals. Two months later, the Seis in court regime required that all government employees sign a decree declaring that they were of Aryan descent. A month later, Jews were banned from all civil service jobs in the country. So you can see just like, first it's like, all right, well, you can't practice your religion, which is terrible. But just, and then a couple months later, it's like, okay, well, you have to say, basically, if you're of Aryan descent or we are identifying who the Jewish people are. Yeah. Now the Jewish people can't work at any civil jobs. So how are they, you know, how are you going to take care of your money? And then it gets worse and worse. They start sequestering them, taking them from their homes and shoving them into parts of town. And they're like, fucking figure your housing out. Man. Um, you have, you know, curfews for certain times you can be out. It just, it's terrible. Okay. So I just wanted to give some background about how this is escalating. These girls are teenagers or I guess, um, you know, or up into their early 20s um, in terms of Hanny. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's get back to Truce and Freddie. So their first kind of start into the resistance movement is they are secretly carrying around like pamphlets and newspapers and flyers with anti-Nazi propaganda, trying to get people on the down low to see about the resistance and get people inspired to also resist. Be like, let's fucking handle some shit, move with this. Yep. And so then their mom moves the family into a house where they help smuggle a Jewish families to safety. So they're part of kind of a, a group of people that kind of carry them from one safe house to the next. A lot of these people have secret rooms Mm -hmm. hidden away, um, special ways that they'll ring a bell or something. So everyone knows to pick up all your stuff that you're holding and take it, run it with you upstairs and don't move um, in case of raids and things like that. Real gangster shit. Yeah. I mean, that alone is incredible and brave and so scary. Um, so then their mother also starts making stencils for the resistance materials and printing them out and the girls are distributing them. So the mom's working with the girls. They're all helping. Right. So one day a man named Franz Vanderveel shows up to their house and their mom knows who he is because of their political circles, but she hasn't really like worked with him before. And Franz is actually there to talk to Truce and Freddie and he wants to talk to them privately. So the mom kind of makes herself scarce. And Franz is a member of the Council of Resistance. So he is a member of like a resistance cell of people. And he basically is like, I he- have heard about the work that your family's doing. I want to see if you want to get more involved. And so he lets them know it's not going to be just hiding people and materials. He said, this is Next going level to be shit. dangerous. Yep. Yeah. He said, this is going to involve weapons. It's going to involve more direct action. Um, it has to be done in complete secrecy. You can't even tell your mom the things that you're going to be doing because remember the security police are always trying to infiltrate. I think that was like a big ask of them because they were so close to their mom and she, she's the one was that, in on it. Yeah. She's but, the one that kind of set them up on their path of right. The resistance. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yes. Interesting that they would keep that from her. Like, yeah. Agree to. So one of the reasons Fran says he wants their help is he said they are gonna, not going to be suspected. So Freddie looked was 14 or 15. She looks like she's 12 years old. She has pigtails that she like two braids. Truce also still is young and looks young. But no one's going to expect resistance people to be girls on bicycles around. They're going to be the least be likely to be suspected, which is really fucking smart of him. Yeah. Um, he says they're going to learn how to use weapons, guns, grenades. They may be asked to blow up things. He even asked them if they thought they could kill someone. And apparently Freddie was like, oh, I've never done that before. 
just like a natural like little response you know like obviously she hadn't done that before yeah. but true says she could if it was quote a real fascist a swine who takes people from their homes to be executed but she does make a point that she knows not all german soldiers are nazis like some people are forced into being it and so she doesn't want to just kill anyone mm-hmm. um Franz doesn't totally agree with her on this. He says basically they're all bad, but he does assure her that if they are to assassinate anybody, they're going to make sure that they've vetted it out and it's truly a bad person. Yeah. And so he says, oh, okay, just in other spy shit. He's like, you have two days to decide. Like, don't tell your mom. Deuces. Two days. And leaves. Let me know if you want in. Yeah. Okay, so after... They must have made a good little name for themselves, though, for them for this dude to come all the way over and... Yeah. I kind agree. Of pull them in. Yes. You know what I mean? Obviously, they'd been brave in what they'd been doing so far. Mm-hmm. And if they hadn't been talking about it, I mean, that's yeah. good. All right. So after he leaves, their mom asks, like, what did you want to talk to you about? And so Truce remembers what he says about don't tell your mom. And she's like, he just wanted to talk to us about running some materials, you know, traditional women's work. And I guess Freddie must have made some kind of face that kind of gave away that wasn't totally true. Mom's going to know. Mm -hmm. And so um, their mom said, uh, this is a quote, she suddenly got very quiet. Then she told them she would check with the others of the party and about the reliability of Franz Vanderweel. She said next she would stay with them. What she said next would stay with them for the rest of their lives. You are free to undertake anything against the Nazis that you feel is right, she said. But be careful and don't let each other down when things get dangerous. Then she spoke from a deep spot in her heart. I couldn't be without you. I hope you'll never do anything mean or anything against your better judgment. Stay human always and under all circumstances. End quote. So she knows that it's something bigger. Yeah. And she's basically giving her blessing. But I also love like she must have taught the girls so well because remember when Truce was like, you know, I don't want to just kill anyone Mm -hmm. if it comes to that. And her mom's like, be true to yourself and what you know is right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't lose yourself in this. Yes. Yeah. All right. So I'm sure it felt like a relief from her to get the blessing. So they ask around about friends and they don't learn a lot, but they get the kind of the okay. They kind of hear like, he's all right. It, we think we can trust him. And so they ride their bike to a meeting spot to talk to him a little bit. And while they're talking to him, Franz asks him for the address of someone who is Jewish and is known to be part of like the resistance party. Mm-hmm. And the girls think that's weird. And they try to dodge the question a little bit. And then he gets more direct and he's like, give me the address. And then he says, I'm actually the Gestapo. <laughs> like, this is a trap. I was in the Gestapo and he gets out pa- documents that have like Nazi symbols on them. No fucking it's way. Like, Are you? Wait, yes. Wait, hold on. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now listen. What? So then um, the girls are fucking panicked. They still aren't giving the address, but they're like, are you fucking kidding me? This, what's so, his name again? Franz. Franz. Yes. So then you True. piece of shit. Yes, I know. Okay. So then True says, can I see your documentation one more time? And he's got a gun pulled on them. So as he takes it out, the girls fucking attack him. They beat the shit out of him. And Truce takes his gun. And finally he yells, stop, stop, stop. He's like, this was just a test. They made me do it. Like, you passed. And so I'm like, They made me do it to see if they would fold? Yeah, to see how they do under pressure because they really could. You know what we're going to do? We're going to fucking fold you into a fucking pretzel, dog. Yeah. What? They (laughs) beat his ass? Yeah, they did. I love it. They were all torn up. Like, I mean, they went wild at him. Ah. And so, again, like, they're basically children. They're incredible, though. Like, right off the bat. SMG should have gun pulled on you and they're like, I'm the fucking Gestapo. Yeah. Yep. And they just start swinging. Yes. I was been so excited to tell you about this. All right. So then he like tries to shake their hands, and I think Truce like spit at him. It's like she was pissed. <laughs> uh, like good for you, girl. So badasses. All right. Despite oh. that, they end up agreeing to work for him or work with him. He's the leader of the cell. And so one of the first assignments they have is to help smuggle Jewish children to save houses in the area. So that's where they start, which is similar to some work they had been doing with their mom. Right. Hiding Jewish people, right? Yes. Smuggling them. Yeah. So months later, Franz presents the girls with a new type of assignment. He has identified a target that he wants to assassinate. So this is... We're just starting with assassination right off the rip, I mean, he gave them a little bit of an intro, and then it was down to the 
down to it. So Franz tells the girls more about the target that he wants to assassinate. It is a Nazi soldier who is known to be a code reader. And so he's reading transmissions between the Dutch resistance movement and British intelligence. And so he said, all right, let's, we're going to go scout him out. So Franz right. takes the girls out so they can see what this guy looks like. And then he lays out the plans. He basically wants the girls to dress up like sex workers who this soldier is known to frequent and basically try to lure him away into a secluded area where other members of their cell will assassinate him. This is some movie type shit. Yes. So the girls, um, practice putting on makeup they practice walking in heels they even went and watched a movie just to see kind of how they're supposed to act because they're just young and inexperienced this is completely completely new new to them um it sounds like they actually had a pretty good time like kind of walking around in their heels and like they and their friends that were in the cell all were kind of laughing Mm -hmm. just about them trying to like figure it out right So um, the day comes and they go to this cafe to wait for the soldier to show up and he never shows up, which is a bummer. But sometimes, you know, things don't go the way that you think they're going to go. Then a few days later, the girls are out just in their normal clothes and they happen to spot this guy. And before they know it, they're talking and Truce is trying to kind of flirt with him. And she tells Freddie to like, go play somewhere, kind of like plan up the... You know, I'm a big sister. Like, get out of here. I want to hang out with this guy. Yeah. Meanwhile, he is like 50 years old and disgusting. And they're, they go into a cafe. He gets a drink. She gets a soda. She's trying to flirt with him. She's looking and to straw. I don't think <laughs> no, she's probably doing that. But um, she's definitely like laying it on thick. And then she tells him that. So while she's doing this, Freddie bikes away and go tells the cell. And she's like, it's fucking on. Like, put your high heels on. No, no, not the. The other cell is dudes. They don't oh. need to wear high heels. They need to go to the secluded spot and get ready. <laughs> to kill this dude. Yes, to kill this dude. So then Fred, or sorry, then True says, you know, I have a place for like a romantic walk on my uncle's property. It's pretty private. Do you want to come? And he's like, fuck yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. And so. I picture her. She's like, do you want to, she's like, I know how to put my legs all the way behind my head. Do you want to see? I don't think And he's that's... like, yes. <laughs> no, I think she was pretty subdued. Apparently, actually, he like kind of made a lewd comment loudly about showing her a thing or two. Mm. It's disgusting. So she's, and um, she makes a comment when she talks about the story later and says like, he's pawing all over her like any old bush would do for him, but she's trying to get him to this spot. Yeah. Then when she gets there, Franz comes out of the bushes and starts popping off, acting like he's the uncle and he's pissed that his niece is there like to dally mm-hmm. with the soldier. So the soldier's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. He goes to turn to walk away dally with her. and Franz pops him in the back of the head and kills him. Pops, shoots him? Shoots him. Okay, you were talking about popping him. I'm like, did he hit him? Oh, that's why I made the little gun. This is your gun? Yeah. This is a little puny gun. I holstered it. Okay. Bop, bop, bop. <laughs> so he shoots him and he dies. And so then the rest, the girls, I don't think, take as much part in this. One of them immediately vomits. Like, what they've done is... Lured a guy. It, it hits them hard. That they and lured so, a man to get... Yeah, and so when you hear about stories about these women, um, like in research or just in anything, it talks about like they seduced men to their death or whatever, which is true. Like this is not the only time they'll do something like this. However, they do so much more than that. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited to tell you about the stories. Like this story is badass. Like what they did is and so young to do that it definitely took a toll on them they didn't enjoy having someone get killed but they part of the gig man yep this is what they signed up for and so when they went back they cried and just kind of held each other and kind of got through it but they were committed to the cause and they felt like it was the right thing to do all right so there's some conflicting accounts about the next thing that happened but we know one of the sisters killed someone who was deemed to be a traitor to the resistance And this man was named Joseph Gerritsen. And so he was a a leader in the resistance or like a higher up member and security police, the ones who look for political criminals, had captured him at one point and questioned him. And they didn't hold him for very long before they released him. Now, it's... Start blabbing? Is that why? Maybe. So it's possible they just didn't have a lot of evidence and they let him go. It's also possible... snitching. ...that he agreed to work with them. Yep. And so people start to get suspicious because more and more people in the resistance are getting discovered by the security police. Right. And so there's a meeting and people start thinking, I think Joseph flipped. 
Yeah. And he needs to be, they would call it liquidated. <laughs> That's just what the group would call it. And so the group, it was a decision that Franz's group would eliminate him. And so um, Freddie was really distraught for weeks afterward, but Truce also later said she was the one who executed Joseph. She had lured him into the woods and accused him of informing on people. He realizes that this is probably a bad situation for him to be in. And so he reaches for his gun and goes to shoot Truce and the gun is empty. One of the members of the resistance had emptied it out oh. before they met. Yeah. Yep. And so then Truce shot him. And so they definitely, like, that was hard. She and Freddie, like, had to work through that. Right. All right. So next, the girls are running routes on their bikes to distribute weapons to different resistance groups. They had these special deep pockets they sewed into their coats um, to conceal some of the weapons. And then sometimes they just had bags full of weapons they'd attached to their bikes, which made it really hard to ride because it was heavy. But it was hard to come by weapons at this point. And so as some became available, they were trying to help spread them out. Um, But and people would get stopped. Uh, and questioned by different police just out and about. Anybody could be questioned at any time. Yeah, if they want to stop you, they can right. and ask you whatever. But there are young girls on bikes. and Nobody's so stopping them. They just go, yep. Yeah. All right, so they're flying under the radar. All right, so back to Hanny Shaft for a few minutes. Um, she is still attending school in Amsterdam, and then she begins to work with a group that is stealing and creating forgery, like uh, ID cards for people. Yep. So at this point in time, everybody had to have identification cards. And if you were Jewish, it was on your card. Um, so also just at this point in time, Jew- Jews were being pulled from their homes. They were segregated into small areas of town. They were given strict curfews. They were prohibited from holding many jobs. And if they were caught moving outside of these designated areas or at designated times, basically you just didn't want to be seen and be Jewish at this point. So having these ID cards, these fake ID cards helped give people a slight level of protection right. to move about. So there's like this huge need for it. And this is the time where she really starts going by the name Hanny instead of Joe, but she officially kind of changes her name to that. And so she, um, at the school, it's getting more and more escalated and the students are asked to all sign some document pledging their allegiance basically to kind of like the Nazis And 80% of the people say no. And she's one of them. She's like, not signing it. And so she decides it's getting too hard to be in school. Like I'm ready to just fully commit myself to the resistance movement. And so she um, finds someone as part of the movement. And he actually sends her to Harlem where Franz and the rest of his group are working. This is where he meets them. Or it's, she meets We're them. getting really close. Yeah. All right. So the Overstegen sisters are away with their mom and their brother. They're laying low after some stuff that they did. Um, but also, Franz is still in his bullshit about testing the newest members of his group. So <laughs> does he I, test her? He sure does. <laughs> so he tells Hanny that she and another member need to go follow this German soldier um, and kill him and so when the time comes she's following him she pulls her gun to kill him and she pulls the trigger and nothing happens and it's fucking franz in a uniform like a who's was posing as the soldier see if he would shoot yeah and if she would shoot yeah and she is pissed i also like to think that he learned from um trues and freddie and he's like i'm gonna put some distance between (laughs) between myself so i don't get my ass kicked again (laughs) But Fuck. fucking friends. So anyway, this dude just likes fucking fucking with people. He does. He likes being I'm a like, troll. He's he a, mo- a shit stirrer. Yeah, he likes being a troll. He's the fucking yep. First of fucking many. <laughs> All right. So Hanny passes the test, and her first assignment is to travel to where Truce and Freddie are to let them need know that friends needs them to come back um, and help with the resistance. And so it's actually really tense because the girls don't know that friends is going to send for them. They don't know who Hanny is. Yeah. And so they're both kind of having an across the table. And what they don't know is that they each have a gun drawn on each other, like in their pocket, like ready to go. Hannah, Hanny and truce both do. And Freddie's there too, but Hanny and truce both have guns ready to fucking shoot each other. God damn. I know. So tense. Well, then Hanny passes over like a coded note from friends and then they realize they're all on the same side and all she like, had to say was he fucking tested me too well she did say it, like name him but they still weren't going to give it up because she could be security police trying to she trick them like, friends had me fucking pull a gun on him he's like listen was fucking... he did this bullshit to me too yeah <laughs> but uh, they actually do end up talking about that i think at some point i'm I sure they did I, well, we yes. beat his fucking ass yeah she was probably like thank god 
<laughs> Dude had my knuckles in his mouth. <laughs> Non-sexual. <laughs> had my knuckles in his cornhole. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so then they're like overjoyed that there's like, basically they immediately recognize that they're on the same side. They're friends and they start connecting, which I love that. Um, all right, so everybody goes back to Harlem, and they become fast friends. So then they do a mission where they infiltrate a group of German soldiers who keep going to this bathhouse. And so they go up there. It's a bathhouse. It's like a place. For sex? No. not. I mean, now I think that's what a bathhouse is. But no, it was like where people would literally go to like bathe or like sit in the sauna. Oh, okay. Stuff like shit like yeah. that. And so they go and flirt, and they try to hear, like just hear intel so then they can go report back because these guys are just bragging and blabbing being loud as fuck and they're like oh my god tell me more about the bombs (laughs) 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 um all right so this next one i'm just going to give a trigger warning for this story it is involves children it is it is sad so um just a heads up but this is a truly terrifying assignment but it is an incredible story that i think is worth telling So Jewish people of all areas are getting rounded up and taken to work in concentration camps. And it is at this point, the worst it's been. Um, And truce is given the assignment to transport 12 children ages three to 14 with one other person to take them to a safe house, 12 children. I can't imagine taking 12 children in happy times, any place with one other person. That sounds like a goddamn nightmare. Yep. Okay. Let alone trying to fucking smuggle them. And they have to get on multiple trains and the story is she's dressed up as a German nurse and these children have, infe- they don't, but this is the story that they have infectious diseases. And so she has like a sign and paperwork that says that. So people try to like leave them alone. Yeah. At the very first station, she's something happens and she gets separated from her partner. And so it's just her that has to take these 12 kids. Man. And, um, she, you know, tries to be stern with them and act like kind of like a Nazi nurse would be mm-hmm. um, for show. But these kids are terrified. And then in private, she's trying to tell them, like, this is who I am. I'm on your side. I have to act this way. You have to act sick. And not everybody is. She is. convinces most of them. There is a boy who's 14 who he's the oldest one. He's over this bullshit and is just frustrated with life understandably and there's a little three-year-old who's like kind of at the other end shut the fuck up i'm trying to help you here yeah so at one point they're on us the second train and a soldier comes in and tries to get them to all give like a heil like the you know the hitler sign hitler Yeah. yeah and the boy won't do it and so she's freaking out and so she yells at him and like slaps him in front of everybody like to make a point so he does it but then like he is still mad at her yeah. about it. And she's like, I didn't want to do that. But we like, we have to blend in. We bro. have to. Right. And then trying to get a three year old to fucking play along. Like, Oh my God. All right. So after they go through multiple trains, she actually has to leave the kids at a spot, go get instructions on how to get to, to a boat. She gets the kids and, um, then, okay. She gets the directions and then she makes it and they have to crawl single file behind her. All 13 of them. Through a literal minefield. No fucking way, yep. man. I have goosebumps. I just, I can't, I cannot even imagine. Minefield, you're just guessing where you're going, So right? that's why she had the map to help guide her. And yeah. so she put, I think, the oldest boy at the back to make sure everybody stayed in. And she was like, you have to put, like, every limb where I put mine and follow me. And, and if one fucks up, the whole group is. Yes. So they do it and they make it. They make it through the actual minefield with all of them. That's wild. And they have a couple fields they have to cross. So there's like another field. The kids are exhausted. They're hungry. They are needing to burn off energy and they have to be quiet because it is pitch black outside and the Germans have searchlights scanning everywhere. Yeah. And they have to get across one more field to get to a boat where there's searchlight still. And at some point, like, Truce tells them a bunch of stories. She runs out and she's like, we might as well just get to the boat. So they get to the boat. They get the kids in. And then a German searchlight sees them while they're in the boat. She's got the oldest kids at the oars. She's up to her waist in the water getting them in the boat. And the 14-year-old boy who's just been over it gets up and screams at the officers. Like, basically, if you're going to shoot, go ahead and shoot me. And they, they do. They light him up. They do. They yeah. kill him. 
And then they start trying to shoot the boat with all the other kids and it's just bullets splashing in the water. Well, when the boy got shot, he capsized the boat Mm -hmm. and everyone fell into the water and there was a hard current and it sweeps the kids away. So Truce is trying to get to shore and she reaches out and she's able to grab one kid and it's the little three-year-old girl. And that's the only child that she was able to find that she was able to grab before they got swept away. And so she and the girl, she takes her and runs, runs for cover and they find a home of, I think it's like a farmer and his wife who also are pro resistance and they take them in and take care of them and they kind of get her back to where she needs to go and they agree to help find the little girl a home. Right. And I mean, we don't know what happened to the other kids and I'd love to think that maybe some of them washed up shore somewhere else, got away but, somehow, but we don't really know. And it's, yeah. So that was something that even just in her life, that was something that was always hard to talk about um, because it was just a failed mission. A failed mission. And, you know, she did everything she could. Honestly, she made it farther than I think most people would have made of in that situation. Okay. Sorry. I know that one was a really sad story. I was sweating just reading it the whole time. And that's not how I expected it to go, but. Um, I think an important part of the story to share. All right. So Hanny um, becomes close with one of the others in the group, a man named Jan Bonecamp. And it's never confirmed that they are romantically involved, but they worked really closely together during the resistance. I think in addition to being close with the girls, she and Jan get very close and they're always together. And so in one of their assignments, they, um, they planned and carried out the execution of a local baker who, along with his sons, had close ties to the Nazis. And um, they basically find out this guy's daily route, and they rode up behind him on their bikes and fired their weapons. Um, their target was wounded, and he died a few days later. And there was a witness to the crime who was a boy, and he didn't really have a lot of information other than he knew that one of the people on the bike was a woman. And so this is the first time that... The Germans are hearing that there is a woman assassin on a bike. Which is not good for them because now they're going to be stopping more women yep. and fucking with them. Yep. So now her partner Jan was antsy for another target. He didn't like to sit idly by. He's like, let's go. Who's next on the list? And um, it's what they called the liquidation list. And this time the target was William Raggett, who or Ragu, unclear, who was a police captain. Both he, dumb fucking... <laughs> last names so he was with the dutch police but he has also been known to work with the security police and turn in jews for bounties so he's handing over his own people mm-hmm. like the, i said stupid for fucking last yep. name. so jan and hanny do a lot of work leading up to this assassination and the plan is that they're going to ride on their bikes and hanny's going to keep is going to shoot first and keep cycling so that way if she doesn't get him or misses or whatever jan's right behind to make sure they take care of him. They're on separate bikes. Yeah. Um, this isn't the first time an assassination attempt was made on Willem's life. And they also learned he carried a second pistol with him on his leg at all times now. And so he was always kind of being watchful. On guard, yeah. yeah. So uh, the day comes of the assassination. Hanny's riding up to Willem. She shoots her gun and she misses him. But he falls over on his bike. Now, she knows, like, you can't turn around, you can't slow down, you keep going. And so she hears gunfire behind her, and what's happening is Jan and Willem are having a shootout. Willem's pulled out his second gun out of his leg holster. Yeah. Uh, Willem has, and he and Jan are having a shootout. Um, Willem is killed in the shootout, and Jan receives a gunshot wound to his stomach. That's not good. It's not. So medical assistance is called and the police realize like Jan is part of a resistance group. And so they want to have him questioned and they call in the German Gestapo. They also know that he's wounded really badly and they think he's probably not going to survive. So we want to try to get any information out of him that we can before he dies. Yes. Okay. So Hanny makes it back to Truce and tells her what happens. She also admits she's in love with Jan and she asks Truce to help her get Jan away from the police. And so the next day the girls bike to the hospital and they make sure they completely cover Hanny's red hair because now there's been more people who have seen her. People Mm -hmm. are starting to hear about a girl with red hair. And when they get there, they realize, like, they aren't going to be able to free Jan. And so they bike back to a meeting place with friends and the others. And they determine they need to move Hanny to a safe house. Like, it's not safe for her. And this is a good move because Jan was in a lot of pain and under 
medication. The Gestapo was questioning him. I'm sure that was unpleasant. And he gives up the names of the uh, he gives up names and addresses of several people in the resistance, including um, the location for where Hanny had been staying and her parents' address. Can't respect that. Who knows no. what he if he was medicated and looped so up? What? what I don't know. Ah, uh, bitch made. Jan does not survive much longer, and he passes away from his wounds. So it turns out the Gestapo had actually been looking for Hanny for quite some time. They only knew her as the woman with red hair and they consider her to be a terrorist. And I mean, from their perspective, she was like, she was taking him out, taking him out. Yep. So the Gestapo. And not to dinner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I don't know what that was. <laughs> I don't either. So the Gestapo raid her parents' house and they, yeah. um, parents say, well. How did they know it was her parents' house? Because Jan gave the address to her oh, parents' that, house. Yeah, that piece of shit. Yeah, I just, she loved him. I don't. She fucking loved the wrong man. Well. She was in right. love with a bitch made boy. I'm not going to say anything about him on that. But um, the Gestapo take Hanny's parents to a concentration camp in an attempt to get Hanny to. To come forward. To come forward. Yeah. Um, now, Hanny lays low for a while and eventually her parents are released. But Hanny can't go out any longer with her red hair. So she dies at a dark brown color. She wears thick glasses. Um, but she really can't stay like out of the resistance movement. She doesn't want to sit by and watch. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in 1944. Hanny's still going through it. Her, when her parents were captured, her depression was terrible. She was feeling really low. She kept talking about maybe I should just turn myself into the Germans and maybe they'll let my parents go, which mm. they're not letting your parents. They're going to throw you right in next to them. Right. And if not yeah. watch, watch, have you watch, uh, Yes. They murder. You know um, what yes, I, mean? I yeah. agree. So the resistance specifically assigns Truce <clears throat> and Freddie to take care of Hanny and make sure she doesn't do anything rash like that. Yeah. Um, I also wrote like I can only imagine like the type of bond they formed, the things they shared with each other, you know. And in one of the articles I read, they called Hanny and Freddie friend soulmates, mm. which I think is really sweet. All right. So the girls continue with a variety of assignments, including transporting packages, smuggling ammunition, and then Franz brings them their next task. He wants them to blow up a bridge. (laughs) And so they learn. Explosives. Yes. So they learn how to do this. And I'm going to quickly summarize. They actually get to the point where they're under the bridge. It's at night and they're trying to set up pieces of the bomb and it's hard to walk around and German soldiers start walking by. Mm -hmm. They have to eventually abandon this mission and they nearly get caught there, but their training still pays off because not long after Franz and some other members of the cell set off explosions on some railways. So they are really in everything. Um, So again, I just want to reiterate, like there are so many examples of missions these girls carried out. The articles online really just high level talk about things, but the book is where you can really find incredible stories. Yes. Right. Yeah. Everybody's going to focus on the seduction and murdering because that's like. It's sexy and flashy. Yeah. And they did that and they did it more than once. How sexy is, how sexy is fucking with explosives and shit though? Like that's even, to me, that's way more sexy. I mean, obviously being seductive and and assassinating is cool, but like you strap a bomb to a fucking railroad. Yes. I agree. Blow some shit up. Yes. Fucking cool. Yes, I agree. Yeah. All right. So here's another story. Freddie was out on the town and while she's just out one day, she spots a man who's known to inform the police. So she books it back and grabs Truce and Hanny and Truce and Hanny grab their guns and hop on a bike. So yeah, let's light this bitch boy up. That's basically it. And so Truce is pedaling and Hanny is sitting on the back of the bike. I'm not sure. I think she was sitting just a bicycle, right? These are bicycles. Yes. On bicycles. They are doing so, drive-bys on bicycles. That's exactly it. Okay, so Truce is pedaling. Hanny's sitting on the back facing the other way, and they drive up on the couple, and Truce tells Hanny to shoot. Hanny's gun jams, so Truce fires her gun and misses, and then Hanny shoots again, and this time she gets the guy who was the target and hits him yeah. multiple times. So um, what they don't know is that they don't kill him, but he's seriously injured, and the woman he was with still sees them as well so the girls ditch their bikes they don't have time to completely get away they ditch the bikes and they run into this cafe and they see the bartender and some guys playing cards and they're basically like we've been here for an hour when people come in here you are going to tell them we've been in here for an hour that's bold and then they say because if they catch us and they go to kill us we're fucking taking you all with us we're going to kill every single one of you so they the bartender pours them drinks they run in the bathroom they put a little makeup on fluff themselves up make sure there's some alcohol in their breath and wait 
And eventually the German police come in and they even like get his attention and they are like kind of like laughing and putting their hand, like putting their hands on him and flirting with him. And he talks to the bartender and apparently the bartender said they'd been there. And so that's fucking bold for them to to go in there and fucking say all this shit and put your trust into strangers. I, I wouldn't. Yeah. Yep. So um, eventually then they go to leave and where they need to cross the street is that same fucking soldier. And so they just keep acting like they're drunk and flirty and they basically bug him until he lets them through yeah. wherever because he just wants to be done with them. Gun but I'm bitch. like, the, <laughs> the absolute just ballsiness of these women is incredible. Yeah, gangster. Um, so I know that they act like very cool, calm and collected on the outside. They did go through a lot of emotional turmoil. And they were always nervous and, like, shared that with each other in private. But, I mean, Mm -hmm. wow. Like, it's just incredible. All right. So, the women continue to find targets on their liquidation list and carry out assassinations. They aren't always successful, but they often are. So, to give you an idea of how they felt about this work, this is a direct quote from the book. And it quotes Truza saying, The shooting of people was terrible. I remember that we cried violently, Hanny, Freddie, and me, arms around each other. It's not a nice job, but it had to happen. At some point, traitors will be found out in your group and they must go. You can't put them in prison. You have to find a solution. And that solution is he must be liquidated. Six feet in the fucking dirt. <coughs> yes. Um, yeah. So they continue to do their work. And now we're in 1945. It's the first day of spring. And Hanny loads up her bag with reading material, like the illegal reading materials. And she is going to go distribute them. Mm-hmm. She also has a pistol sewn in a special like compartment in her bag. And she adds some food because she's going to be gone a while. She gets everything attached to her bike and she starts to ride. Now, she comes up to a checkpoint, which is normal. The girls have come across these a million times, and Mm -hmm. everyone just always, like, lets them through. Yeah, but now that they know that women are assassinating these dudes. Yes. So, I don't know if this was, like, a thorough officer, or it was because they knew to be on the lookout for women on bicycles or what, but they search her, and they find the illegal materials. The gun. Which, they haven't found the gun. They find the materials, which is wild. All the things she's done and she gets busted for some like underground newspapers. Yeah. So they go to um, transport her to be detained and her gun falls out of her bag. And that really makes them look harder at her because at this point, like no one has weapons except for people who mean fucking business. And there's no reason a girl on a bike should have a weapon. And, and they so, keep hearing about this girl on a bike that's assassinating yes. people. Yep. Now, her yep. hair is dark at this point, so they can't recognize her as the girl with the red hair. But they know they need to question her more thoroughly because there's something more here. So people hear about her in the prison, and they want to find out about her. Um, and so in an even worse turn of events, there's a Gestapo agent in town and he knows all about the girl with red hair and he hears about this woman found with a pistol at a checkpoint and he thinks I would like to go see her and talk to her and so he takes her into custody and at first he doesn't recognize her but at some point he's driving her in the car and it hits him oh so he despite the fact she has dark hair he gets it and this is a quote from him that came from the book In my mind, I was trying to go through all sorts of files, trying to figure out who she was, he recalled. Then suddenly I knew. Your Hanny Shaft. It was quiet for a moment. Then she turned to me and said yes. End quote. So, this is not good. I don't know why she would admit so quick. I don't know. I don't know. She's bold. Um, You're goddamn right. I don't think she meant it like that. I think she just decided she was going to admit it. Yeah. Um, I think she was also... I'm the one that's been smoking all your dudes. I think that... (laughs) Non-sexual. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, Truce and Freddie see her get detained, and they freak out. And so, they try to get to friends and tell the group in time. There's nothing they can do, though. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. All right. So, this is really bad because she's been wanted for quite some time, she is thoroughly interrogated. She never gives up any names or addresses of her comrades. She, and I'm sure they 
did some awful stuff to her. I'm but, sure they tortured the shit out yeah. of her. So meanwhile, Truce is doing everything she can to try to free Hanny or like exchange for her release. And no one's really helping her. Um, on the side of the resistance, like not friends, but people above him, leadership had changed and people just really weren't concerned about Hanny, which is bullshit because she had done so much for them. The Germans are losing the war at this point. And so everybody's kind of telling her, like, oh, Holland's going to be fine. Like, you know, it's going to be free soon. I'm sure they're just going to let her go. No one's going to kill her at this point. And they just kind of pat her on her head, like, by a little woman and send her on her way. That's bullshit. Yep. And so Hanny is, or sorry, not Hanny, Truce and Freddie are pissed. And they come up with this elaborate plan. They're going to visit the jail where Hanny is being held. They're going to dress up like nurses. And they have undergarments. They've said that they've come to bring her, but they've sewn in like little notes of encouragement into all the undergarments just to let her know, like, we're fighting for you. We love you. you. Yes. Yeah. So um, they finally get to the prison. They talk their way in only to find out Hanny is not there. So what Truce and Freddie don't know is that even though the war is nearing an end and Germany is losing, Hanny is considered like definitely a terrorist by the Germans, and they are furious about all the people she's killed and the havoc she's wreaked. And they want justice. Um, they want blood as retribution. And three days before Truce had come to the prison, Hanny had been marched from her cell and placed before a firing squad. Fuck. It's reported that when the first shot was taken, it only grazed her in the head. And at first she exclaimed, oh, and then went to tell them that she was a better shot. <laughs> Incredible, right? Oh. And then they completed their execution of her. I love that she got a little bit of disrespect out uh, yeah. off their first shot. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. That's all you got? No, there's more to the story still. No, I know. Oh, 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 yes. The shooters. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all you got? Yeah. She said, I'm, I'm a better shot. I'm sitting here on my knees and you fucking yep. can barely graze me. Yeah. Mm. So it's just so fucking sad because we're so close to, um, she was buried in the nearby dunes and the war came to an end just a few weeks later. Yeah. She was so close. So close. So once the war was declared over, Truce and Freddie went to Amsterdam to see the prisoners being released. They're waiting and Hanny never comes out. They actually had brought flowers to give to her and since she never came out they found another woman who was released another political prisoner and that woman had no one there to greet her which and they greeted her and they gave her the flowers and stuff which i think is really sweet yeah all right so in may and june a group was sent to find the bodies of resistance fighters buried near the prison so they could be identified and buried properly and all um, in all they found 421 men in the body of one woman who was handy shaft uh, there were too many b- people to bury all at once, like for ceremonial purposes. So they picked one person to represent mm-hmm. that group and they picked Hanny. That's what's up. All right. So after the <clears throat> war, Truce and Freddie were first involved with a group that was created to seek out Dutch traders, but they don't like the tactics of this group and they decide I'm, I'm not going to be a part of this anymore. So they continue to meet with other friends and previous members of the resistance group at Hanny's grave to celebrate her and just be together. Truce went on to marry um, Piet Menger, who she met during the resistance work, and they had four children together. Their firstborn was a daughter who they named Hanny. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Truce went on to learn about sculpture from a woman who actually allowed the resistance to meet at her like art studio in her home. Um, so I just think that's so beautiful that they stayed connected after that. And she gave kind of Truce a new avenue in her life. Right. Um, Freddie also got married to a man named Jan Decker and they had three children together. Both sisters went on to um, speak about their time in the war. They did interviews and appeared in documentaries, which I want to see if we can find some. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't want to do it beforehand, yeah. but I'm like, I want to see them move. I want to hear them talk. It just, yeah. they're incredible. We should watch that tonight. I'm fucking in. Let's go. All right. Freddie and Truce received multiple honors for their bravery and actions during the war. Truce was always more outspoken about it, um, but Freddie did speak out more later in life, and the sisters remained extremely close through their lives. An article in The Guardian quoted Truce's daughter as saying, One word was enough for them to understand each other, recalled Menger, Truce's daughter. They had relied on each other completely during the war. Their lives were in each other's hands. In an article I read on DutchReview.com, it emphasized the long-lasting impacts the war had on the sisters. Quote, 
In an interview with Vice, Freddie said that once the war ended, she coped by getting married and having babies. However, her son Remy believes the war never stopped for his mother. In an interview with NH News, he claimed that the war actually lasted 80 years for Freddie. Freddie expressed a similar sentiment when, herself when talking to Vice about conversations with her sister. We never had to say, remember when, because it was always at the top of our minds. That's sad. Yeah. But they never forgot their dear friend Hanny, and Truce established the National Hanny Schaff Foundation, and Freddie served on the board of the foundation. Truce passed away in June 2016 at the age of 92. Damn, And Freddie son. passed away a few years later in September of 2018, one day before her 93rd birthday. That's fucking crazy. I know. So these girls, my grandma is like 94, 95, 96, somewhere. Mm-hmm. Terrible for not knowing, but... She was around when these girls were doing what they were doing. Yeah, That's she was. That's fucking crazy. Yeah. That's crazy um, that they fought through and... and they survived so long and they so had long, long and lives. Think about how much you've seen from World War II all the way up until 2018. Yes. Think about all the shit that you've seen and how much the world changed. Yes. That's crazy. It is. I just, again, like, I can't emphasize enough how brave these women were, um... The Overstegen's mother felt that saying that they seduced soldiers to kill them was, quote, reductive, meaning kind of diminishes all the other stuff yeah. they did, which is one of the reasons, again, I was so excited to tell the story is I wanted to tell some of the other things, the other things they did because they were just incredible. Boss bitches. Boss bitches. I mean. Standing on big business. Yes. I mean. Yeah. They were killing it. Women. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So yeah. I'm glad you liked it. I've just been, I've been dying to tell you this as I was mm-hmm. reading stuff all it was week. Cool. It was Thank real cool. you. Yeah. All right. Well, any other thoughts? <clears throat> no, just that uh, it was gangster. Yeah. Gangster story. It was. Yeah. All right. Well, again, I'm Whitney and this is Brandon and thank you for listening. Um, Check out our TikToks uh, for highlights on each episode. Also check out our YouTube channel for the full video version of this podcast. Yes. If you like what you've heard, um, we please uh, encourage you to leave a review or a like, depending on what you're listening on. We'll be posting new episodes every Monday. Thanks everyone. Bye. And that's the show.